prayer, the wonderful privilege and tool in the hand of a Christian. The Bible talks about the incredible power that prayer has. James 5, 16 through 18 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. But at the same time, the Bible makes it clear that prayer is not a substitute for obedience. Proverbs 28.9 says, He that turneth away his ear from hear, hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. The, the one who refuses to hear what God says. Well, God will refuse to hear what he says. There are so many people that want to ignore what God has said in his word. And they want to look for blessings through prayer that the Bible doesn't promise through prayer. There are things that those who are not converted pray for that well, don't come that way. Sure, everybody's heard about a sinner's prayer. But I want us to think this morning about what should a sinner pray for? Should a sinner pray for God to love him? Well, he already does. John 3.16, the only verse that some people know of the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Paul spoke on the same topic. He said, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So if it's just a matter of love, sinners already got God's love. Should the sinner pray for Christ to come to him? Well, Christ has invited the sinner to come to him. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will bring you rest. John 5, 39 and 40 says, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, and ye will not come to me that ye might have life. And that's where some people are today. They want to sit where they are. And pray for Christ to come to them when all the time he's saying, come to me. How about them praying for God to be reconciled to them? There are a lot of ch churches that teach this. That, that the sinner should pray for God to be reconciled to them. But the thing is, God isn't the one who moved. God isn't the one who needs to change. What's the Bible say? All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And hath given to us, the apostles, the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ 
reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Not God who needs to change to meet man. Romans 5.10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. How about praying for religion? How many times have you heard people talk about getting religion? The, 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 the problem with that is, according to the Bible, religion is not something you get. Religion is something you do. James 1.27, pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Our religion is taking care of those who are in need. We are supposed to be doing something, not sitting there waiting for something to happen to us. Show a sinner sit and pray for a change of heart. How many times have you ever heard that? Praying that God would come and change my heart. Well, once again, that's not the way the Bible describes things. The Bible describes hearts being changed by faith and obedience. Acts 15, 9, describing the unity that now existed between Jew and Gentile. It says, and put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. 1 Peter 1.22, seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. We have that pure heart and purified soul by obeying the truth, not sitting around and praying. Should the sinner pray for their sins to be forgiven? I'm sure a lot of them do. But once again, that's not the way things are described in the Bible. You can't find one place where somebody who is outside of that relationship to God, being told to say a little prayer, and, and, and ask Jesus to come into their hearts. Most of that was developed by a baseball player by the name of Billy Sunday. who lived about 1,900 years too late to be included in the Bible. What's the Bible say? When a crowd asked Peter, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
when Saul of Tarsus was confronted on the road to Damascus. He was struck blind. He spent three days praying, mourning over his sins, refusing to eat. And when somebody came to him, He was told, now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord, Acts 22, 16. First Peter chapter 3, Peter used the illustration of Noah and his family. How the flood carried them from a, a world full of sin to a world that had been purified. And in verse 21, he said, The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God, but by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. the ones who have already been forgiven, who are, have already entered that relationship with God, are the ones who are told that they have that avenue of prayer available. Acts chapter 8. We meet a man that we know as Simon the Sorcerer, who had been an influential man in Samaria. And it says, and Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Acts 18, 13 through 22. He was told, to pray for forgiveness, but you notice he was told that nine verses after it said he believed and was baptized, which according to Mark 16, 16 means he was saved then. How about praying for the Holy Spirit? Some people, some people pray for that. Acts 5.32 says, We are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. Now, We've talked before about how the Holy Spirit indwells the believer, and we don't need to rehash that. But the point is, when does he do that? This says that the Holy Spirit is given to those that obey God, which means 
if you're sitting around praying for the Holy Spirit to come to you, you're not doing what the Bible says. How about sanctification? That's one of those fancy Bible words you don't hear outside of church buildings. But some people say you're supposed to pray for sanctification. Pray for God to make you holy. That's what that word means. Well, John 17, 17 Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. We want to be made holy. We want to be sanctified. Jesus said that comes through God's truth, which is his word. We need to be going to his word for that. And not praying for something that's already been given. All sorts of things that people are told that an unsaved person should pray for. The Bible says that's not how that happens. God has made his law. And he doesn't set that law aside for anyone. He didn't set his law aside for Moses. Numbers chapter 12. Miriam was struck with leprosy. Verses 13 and 14, Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, O God, I beseech thee. And the Lord said unto Moses, If her father had but spit in her face, should she not be ashamed seven days? Let her be shut out from the camp seven days, and after that, let her be received in again. So, something relatively minor. She'd be kept out, be considered unclean for seven days. Even with that miraculous cleansing. God's law was still that she needed to stay there to fulfill that time. And that's what his law said. That's what would happen. The rich man of Luke chapter 16 was rich and powerful when he was on earth. But no matter how rich and powerful he was on earth, and no matter how much he begged later, God didn't change his law either. Starting at verse 19, it says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. 
neither can they pass to us which would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto, them, unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. See, Lazarus thought, or the rich man thought, Lazarus going back. That's what it would take. That, that, would, that would do it. But that's not the way God's law works. It's appointed unto man wants to die. And after this, the judgment. He wasn't going to go back for that. God wouldn't change his law for Cornelius. He's described, Acts 10 and 11, as a devout man, well-respected, a praying man. But what was he told? Acts 11, 13 and 14, send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter who shall tell thee words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Not only wasn't he told to pray to be saved, he wasn't even told directly by the angel what he should do to be saved. Because God had already said that men would carry that word. So it wasn't for the angels to preach it. We already said he wouldn't change his law for Paul. Acts 9-11 talks about him praying in the house of Judas in, in Samaria. And he was told to arise and be baptized and wash away his sins. Acts 22, 16. So what is it a sinner should be praying for? Instead of looking to prayer, they need to do what the Bible says. The Bible says that the sinner the one who is outside of that relationship needs to hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They need to believe sincerely with all their heart. Hebrews eleven six. 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You need to repent of your past sins. Acts 17.30, we talked about in Bible class, the times of this ignorance God overlooked, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You need to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Matthew 16, 16. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. You need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Mark 16, 15 and 16. He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And after that, you need to continue to remain faithful, even in the faith, face of death. Revelation 2.10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. If you have never done those things, if you've never done what the Bible says to have that 
relationship to be one of God's children. Well, what's that mean? If you've done that in the past, but you haven't been faithful, you have the opportunity to make things right now. If there's anything you need to do, we ask that you would come forward in simple, obedient faith. As together we stand and sing songs of encouragement. I'm satisfied in me, just a cottage below.